Welcome to Views from the Corner Office, a conversation with private sector leaders who influence and impact the federal market. Views from the Corner Office delivers a perspective on technology, acquisition, and leadership issues through the lens of executives who lead the federal practices of government contractors. Now your host, Jason Miller. My guest today is Sudhakar Ramakrishna, the CEO of Pulse Secure. Sudhakar, welcome to the program. Uh, Jason, thanks for having me. This discussion we're having today is a little different than my normal views from a corner office discussion. Usually I have a government contractor, but Pulse Secure is a government vendor, which is a little different. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But let's start maybe at the beginning. You guys do work with the federal government, usually through value-added resellers and other partners. But it's still a good time for even uh, a few of vendors like yourself to be in the federal market. Tell me why it is a good time to be a government vendor. The federal market has always been a very important market for uh Pulse Secure, but also for other major security uh, vendors. The federal government and the federal sector generally tends to be a pioneer in many cases and an early adopter uh, of uh, security solutions. Obviously, there's a lot of challenges uh, that are being faced by the federal government and, uh, broadly speaking, the commercial sector as well, be it related to uh, the increase of the types and the depth and the complexity of the threats that they're facing, what I would call insider challenges, meaning the separation of the federal uh, enterprise itself from an outside and an inside perspective, leading to the thrust around zero trust, uh, which again, the federal government has been a big proponent of. And then the adoption of mobile technologies and cloud, for instance, have increased uh, the challenges as it relates to visibility and ensuring compliance in the broader sector, but specifically in the federal sector as well. All of these challenges and problems obviously result in the ability for somebody like us to solve these problems. And in that, in that context, the federal government uh, and the federal sector seem, uh, is a very large opportunity for us. Now, it's interesting you say that the government has maybe been an early adopter. Uh, sometimes security companies and, and other technology companies will say the government's always a step behind because they are risk averse. They don't want to have failures, so they want to adopt something they know. Is security a little different based on the breaches we've seen, whether it's the VA breach from 2006 or the OPM breach from 2015, that has pushed them to be more of, of on the front end of security? Uh, definitely, Jason. Uh, it has pushed them into the into the forefront of security, I would say, because as you know, even at the national government level, uh, at the Congress level, security in various forms, uh, sometimes these are international threat actors, so to speak, or the general standard security from uh, information protection, access capabilities, etc., are all relevant. The federal government also has to be very efficient in terms of delivering and adopting new technologies like cloud and hybrid, as an example, or even mobile technologies. So the locking down of the areas and creating walled gardens is no longer practical, even in the federal sector. And so the way I think about it is when people say they are risk averse, the way I would describe it is that they are risk aware as opposed to risk averse. And in the context of being risk aware, if they can be diligent about who the security providers are and ensure that they are going through the right certifications, integrations, etc., then the speed of delivery and deployment increases and the security of the environment also increases. So those are the two uh, key things I would say. The federal sector is looking for us as vendors. That's one reason why we work with integrators and others to deliver complete solutions. I'm a little surprised you didn't say the budget. So many people, when I talk uh, and ask the same first question every time, hey, you know, is it a good time to be a federal contractor? Everyone says, well, we have budget uncertainty, or the fact is we know what the budget looks like, or they just got a budget deal done. That, that affects you a lot less than maybe a more, quote unquote, traditional government contractor, doesn't it? In many respects, yes. Although even as a vendor, we would like for better predictability on the budgets and the speeding up of the budget processes and the allocations of them as well. Because we work with uh, other aggregators and larger federal contractors, and to the degree that they are impacted, we get impacted as well. The criticality and the significance or the benefit like we bring to the table is 
we are a very diversified business. So while the federal sector is a very important sector for us as a vendor, uh, we have a very large commercial presence as well. And we are always trying to call it cross-pollinate, meaning the trends and the technologies that we've built for the commercial sector, we try to see how they can apply to the federal sector. And to the degree that we learn about things in the federal sector, we try to take them back to the commercial sector. So in many ways, we tend to be unique in that respect. And so to your point about budgets, et cetera, we are able to diversify our business because of our presence in more than 80% of the Fortune 500, for instance, uh, that allows us to uh, take things into the federal sector and vice versa. You bring up trends, and I think that's a great segue to the next question, because what are some of the trends you are seeing, whether from the commercial to the federal or vice versa? Trends, uh, as uh, you know, Jason, is a very fascinating subject, and especially in the security space, um, the trends are evolving, I would say, even faster than many other uh, sectors. Let me highlight a few and happy to elaborate on some as you please. Uh, The first one I would say is the security challenges that customers are facing, Uh, let's start with the uh, commercial sector, are increasing at a rate that has never been seen before. Uh, That is further complicated, I would say, in many ways by the demands from the customer's customers for more freedom and less control, Uh, meaning that I want to be using a device wherever I am located. I want you to move my applications to the cloud. I want you to deploy a hybrid policy, et cetera, et cetera. Some of it is economics. Some of it is user experience. Some of it is simply user preference. And all those things, what happens is that it complicates security policy. It makes it more difficult for uh, companies to ensure that their security posture is proper and protected. So that's one key aspect. But the other side of the coin is that companies have fewer resources to procure, deploy, and make useful these solutions. So on one hand, the number of security solutions is growing. On the other hand, customers have fewer people and fewer resources to manage all this. So the implication from a vendor community standpoint is make things incredibly easy to use, make things more integrated. Uh, Don't make your customers' environments your test labs. I mean, those are all things that we subscribe to very deeply and strive to support our customers and make their lives simpler, so to speak. That's that's one key thing. Two is with the advent of, call it the broadly speaking, the internet of things, more and more things are getting connected uh, to the internet. So that causes a visibility problem, so to speak, for customers, meaning what's connecting to my networks, what is Uh, really allowed into my networks, uh, what should be allowed, et cetera, et cetera. And and so that has got a lot of people thinking and worrying about uh, what the unknown, so to speak. That results in if all these things are happening, am I compliant, uh, whether it is to my internal audit needs or external audit needs? So compliance becomes a bigger uh, and bigger issue that everybody has to to worry about. So these combined with the economic challenges, uh, you mentioned budget in the federal sector, budgets in the commercial sector always tend to be quite tight as well. And so what what does cloud mean? Can I use the cloud and save dollars, become more efficient as an example? So that at the same time increases complexity from a security standpoint. So these are some of the broader trends that are happening. And I think the important thing from a vendor community standpoint is make things more simple, even as you keep them secure, uh, to enable customers to manage these things better and give customers option. Don't force them into the cloud or don't fixate them into a data center. Uh, Adopt hybrid approaches and give seamless access uh, to those customers. A couple interesting things I want to pull the string on. Let me start with, uh, obviously, the increasing number of threats. We've seen that for the last you know, five or ten years. But the, the freedom side, and I think that's something that the government, the federal government, is just starting to come to grips with. That, And you're seeing a big push for, for, for citizen services, user experience, and things like that. How did you, as a security vendor, f- kind of listen to what the government is saying and take that into account as you're developing products and and solutions? Freedom 
in this particular context comes on two fronts. Uh, first, uh, from an administrator perspective, meaning the person that is uh, um, setting policies, setting up infrastructure, applications, etc. The freedom that we are trying to enable for them is how do I kind of create investment protection for what you've already bought while you extend into new deployments, let's say, in the cloud, as an example. How do I give you freedom to adopt applications that are modern, that may be delivered from the cloud without compromising what you have built over the years um, in your data centers? How do I ensure policies, security practices are consistent between the cloud and the data center? So that's broadly called hybrid IT or hybrid security in this particular context. So that's the level of freedom we need to provide to uh, everybody, including the federal sector, because that's becoming an increasingly important uh, requirement. Obviously, there's an economic dimension to it, budget dimension to it as well. On the other side, I would call them end users requiring freedom, and that could be, be it use my mobile device, um, be it uh, use uh, my system from anywhere, uh, be it uh, local, be it remote, uh, be it in another country, without compromising um, my security posture and giving me freedom to be productive. Freedom essentially equates to simplicity, which then allows you to be more productive. What we have done is on the end user side, uh, we have client software that is identical across all platforms. So whether you take Windows, um, Mac, uh, Linux, etc., what we ensure is that the user experience on all of those platforms is identical. So when a customer or an end user switches from one platform to another, they don't have to relearn things. That's uh, a very important element of giving them freedom to choose whatever platform they want to use. Uh, then obviously there is the integration into the platform itself where they don't feel like they're using separate and new technologies. So in other words, what we have done is on all operating systems, we have a approach which we call a workspace. In fact, many customers in the federal sector use this particular product, which allows a end user to use any device of their choosing, but as long as they have the workspace, because the workspace is protected, so you're separating always the personal from the business. That also is an option that we give to the federal sector where they are able to not have to procure a lot more devices than they absolutely need to, and then worry about how they lock them down. So that's another form of freedom uh, that kind of ties both types of freedom that we just discussed. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we can jump into some of those other things you talked about in terms of trends. My guest is Sudhakar Ramakrishna, the CEO of Pulse Secure. I'm Jason Miller, and you're listening to Views from a Corner Office on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. Welcome back. You're listening to Views from a Corner Office on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. I'm your host, Jason Miller. My guest is Sudhakar Ramakrishna, the CEO of Pulse Secure. Now, Sudhakar, before break, we were talking about some of the trends, and one of the trends you brought up that I want to kind of touch upon is the move to IoT, connected devices, Internet of Things, whatever we're going to call it these days. And so much of it, as you said, causes a visibility problem. As agencies are putting more things online, they have to be able to protect and know that they're there. Walk me through that challenge of, of if you can't see it, you can't protect it. This is uh, becoming a increasingly relevant thing, both in the commercial sector as well as in the federal sector. I cannot tell you how many times I would go to a customer. For instance, the conversation goes like this. Uh, I'll generally ask a customer, how many devices do you think are at any point in time connected to your network? versus connecting and connecting to your network. And oftentimes, let's say they come up with an answer like um, 5,000. Uh, and within a few weeks of running some software and uh, identifying what's getting connected to them, we routinely find that they're off by a factor of two or three, and in some cases, a factor of 10 in many cases. So what happens is that that really creates an aha moment for them saying, I, if I don't even know what's trying to connect to my network, how will I ever be able to protect it? Uh, and that is really the visibility challenge, and that's greatly exacerbated by the, the whole IoT trend or, as you said, connected uh, Internet trend, where 
on one hand, I say it is very good and very productive for all of these devices to be connected to the internet, quite simply because it makes administrators' life in terms of understanding various forms of connections, connectivity, and usage that much more simpler. But with that kind of freedom comes the complexity of what is the security capabilities of these devices? Are they running the right types of software? How can I attach policy to that? All those things become very important, and that's where the first step is to understand what is being connected to the network, and uh, therein lies the visibility challenge. And uh, again, this has become a very top-of-mind topic for both commercial as well as the federal sector. I know in the federal sector, they're using the Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation, or CDM, program, and, and that has played a big role in understanding what's on the agency's networks. But at the same time, it doesn't mean they know how to, to secure those devices. They just may know that they're there. And, and I think that, that leads us down the path of another kind of related trend, which is why zero trust is getting so much attention in the federal market. And, and I know you guys are in the zero trust world, too. But let's walk me through a little bit. Zero Trust, we know, is an umbrella. It's, it's a framework. It's not any one technology. But what are you seeing from when you talk to agencies about Zero Trust? And it is becoming increasingly a top-of-mind topic. Um, traditional way of looking at security was you had an enterprise boundary or a perimeter. Call it a walled garden. Every t- bit of traffic that comes from outside the enterprise per- perimeter was deemed unsafe or insecure by definition and therefore had to be protected and uh, authorized. On the converse, everything that was inside the perimeter was deemed secure and should have free access. Increasingly what's happening, and this happened a lot more in the commercial sector, is that more and more threats are starting from inside the network. Think of a very simple case. I'm working on my computer at home I get infected by something happening on the internet, I come inside the network perimeter, uh, meaning inside my office, I open up my laptop, and I have the danger of infecting the entire uh, system. So that's becoming increasingly prevalent, uh, and there are many more sophisticated ways of doing that, but I'm giving you a very basic example. That is leading to this notion of, hey, I can't, traffic, I can't trust traffic coming from the outside, nor should I trust anything that's inside, leading to the concept of zero trust. While on one hand, everybody is beginning to be aligned on zero trust, what it also creates is what is the best way, most economical way, and uh, simply put, the most secure way of addressing this zero trust challenge. Uh, And that's what vendors like us and others are attempting to do both for the commercial sector as well as the federal sector. When you talk to your federal clients, when you work with your your partners, is Zero Trust one of those things that just comes up constantly, or is it something that's maybe more that that is just starting to come up now or the last six months? I would say it is increasingly coming up, uh, Jason, and I would say the number of asks or mentions is actually accelerating, is probably the best way to characterize it. And at the same time, though, nobody's really doing zero trust, at least from my perspective, the, the people I've talked to. I think a lot of people are, are just talking about it. Do you, is that something you're seeing, or do you, do you actually see the pieces being put in place to create that zero trust environment? I would actually humbly submit that we and some others are actually addressing zero trust in a very comprehensive way right from the get-go and increasingly as our portfolios uh, continue to evolve to support the the freedom requirement that we spoke about both for administrators and end users. What we are really doing now is mapping what we do to the concept of zero trust. So in other words, uh, this is not a case of a new concept coming up and then everybody catching up to it. Uh, We are all figuring out how to reinforce and reemphasize what we do in the zero trust framework. So in that regard, I would say the solutions from us and some others are actually closer to customer needs uh, than simply a concept. That's interesting because you hear so much talk about it and everyone says, well, there's the the identity management piece and then there's the, you know, hardware asset and software asset management piece. And there's, you know, kind of all these pieces and parts that fit on the umbrella. But it's good to hear that, you know, it's it's almost like the the message from uh, vendors like yourselves is that, hey, 
the pieces are there. You you just as the agency maybe just has to put them together and we can help you with that integration, of course, or, or somebody else can help you with that integration. But, but it's just a matter of integration versus having to find new pieces or develop new technology. Yeah, Jason, one of uh, the more prominent agencies is actually part of our customer council. And more recently, just uh, actually in May of this year, we hosted a customer council which included them and other commercial customers as well. We do that routinely to essentially cross-pollinate best practices between commercial and federal. There we went through our zero trust solutions, not zero trust plans, so to speak. And, and simply put, in, in the approach that we take, we authorize and authenticate users, which is the identity problem that you highlighted, devices, to ensure that the devices that are connecting are compliant and have the right security posture, et cetera, et cetera. Applications to make sure that applications are authorized to be delivered in a certain way and used by the users. And last but not least, the networks. So users, devices, applications, and networks are all authorized and provided access by our solutions. The combination of those will allow a customer to deploy a zero trust environment. So the more we are able to educate them in those terms and language that they already know, they're getting more and more comfortable with zero trust and obviously derive the benefits of zero trust by not having walled gardens and not having different security policies for inside and outside. So we've taken that approach and um, while the adoption in the commercial sector has been faster, uh, I will say that uh, the conversations in the federal sector are also accelerating. Do you get a sense that the reason why the conversations are accelerating is because of the technology model you mentioned earlier and how much it's changing, the hybrid technology, the hybrid cloud, the hybrid IT that we keep hearing about? To some degree, yes. Uh, Jason, I also think to a large degree, it is the obligation of vendors such as ourselves to be able to articulate these things simply to the federal sector and others and highlight how we are adding value to them rather than pushing a specific product or a point solution to them. In other words, if we work backwards from this concept which we define internally as customer success and doing what's right and solving their problems, including integrating with third-party vendors, uh, we will be able to accelerate the, their journey. And uh, so it's a combination of really solving the problem and then mapping it onto their particular problems and environments. Are there other pieces of that technology model or the, or the, or the business model that you're seeing that they're starting to really change uh, as you spend more time in the federal market? So as we think about the business models themselves, um, increasingly I feel there is a greater awareness of uh, business models like subscription, for instance, even in the federal sector, which w I would not have said a, uh, a few years ago. Uh, but I think this is a bleed over, so to speak, from the commercial sector into the federal sector where more and more customers, again, either budget constrained or not, are thinking about subscription-based models, as well as agencies that offer services to other agencies are thinking about pay-as-you-go pay-as-you-grow type uh, models as well. That requires both the aggregators and contractors to adapt and adopt uh, new business models, which then obviously translates to us as well. On our side, because of the fact that we've done all of this on the commercial sector, we try to add value to our aggregators and contractors by uh, updating them, so to speak, on a regular basis, as well as our agency conversations on business transformation trends as well. I think that's a great point of the awareness of the subscription model and really move to, I like that, pay as you grow. So I think that's something we're going to see a lot yeah. more of. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we can continue our conversation, learn a little bit about you and, and Pulse Secure. My guest is Sudhakar Ramakrishna, the CEO of Pulse Secure. I'm Jason Miller, and you're listening to Ask the CIO on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. Welcome back. You're listening to Views from a Corner Office on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. I'm your host, Jason Miller. My guest is Sudhakar Ramakrishna, the CEO of Pulse Secure. Now, Sudhakar, before break, we're 
talking about the trends you're seeing, some of the, the difference between being a, a vendor in the marketplace versus a contractor. So let's get into a little more de- depth about what Pulse Secure is, uh, your role in the federal market, and as well as your role as CEO. Talk a little bit about uh, your company. As CEO, obviously, my main focus is customer success, as I previously defined, uh, regardless of the sector uh, that the customers are in, whether it be in the federal sector or in the commercial sector. Uh, We have a strategy uh, within the company of fulfilling almost everything we sell through our partners. Uh, Partners add a lot of value to customers. They provide direct touch to customers, etc. But equally, we believe in maintaining direct touch and contacts with uh, as many customers as we possibly can. Almost every agency in the federal sector is our customer as well, granted through our aggregators and our partners. Some of the agencies are actually on our customer council, so we get a direct connection and connectivity with uh, these customers. We are able to have uh, conversations about trends, highlight what's happening in the commercial sector, learn from them as to their uh, aspirations for their own agencies and others, uh, and then work with our partners uh, in terms of responding to larger RFPs, fulfilling, etc. So the way I would describe it is we have a direct touch model with the end customer and a indirect fulfillment model uh, with the likes of DLT solutions and Emex and others. Walk me through what a typical, if you will, bid would look like for a company like yours, a, a, a vendor versus a contractor. Uh, do you, if you, if you're partners with a a systems integrator, do they call you up and say, hey, we have this opportunity? Walk me a little bit just through what it, maybe it was something that's typical. I'll give you a couple of scenarios that are typical. And one is customers already deployed our solution through both our touch and the partner's touch over the years. And they're looking at, let's say, expanding slash modernizing, right? Uh, in those cases, it's a much simpler procurement model because we are already in the environment and the customer is looking to expand, it still comes to us through the reseller slash um, aggregator slash contractor, uh, but it's a fairly straightforward uh, win, so to speak. In other cases, the contractor might have an RFP. Let's call it a, hey, the agency is looking for increased and improved visibility. We've been asked to respond with um, specific vendor solutions can you work with us on responding and creating a very comprehensive response to the agency? So that is the other form, which is much more uh, elongated at some level, but uh, we go through that uh, process as well. And uh, in many cases, co-present with our partner as well as the agency's needs dictate. So those are the two typical models. It's, uh, It's rarely something where out of the blue, they just come to us and say, hey, do you have something like this? It's interesting, the, the two kind of paths you guys go down on to, to kind of get in front of the customer and, and, and work with, with your partners. How different is that than just bidding on your own? Did, did you guys ever think about maybe we would just sell directly to the government? Or have you always gone down the path of partners and, and value-added resellers? We've always go- gone down the path of partners and value-added resellers. Uh, you could say that to some degree that comes from our commercial heritage, Uh, Because in the commercial space, we are in every major geography. We have over 20,000 customers. So providing direct touch to every one of them or direct fulfillment, I should say, uh, becomes incredibly difficult. So that's where we kind of learned our ropes, uh, so to speak, on working with partners and being dedicated to partners. And we carried that forward into the federal sector. And we've been doing that for the better part of 10 years. Many times when I talk to when I talk to people for the show, they're the head of federal, they're a senior vice president, maybe they're a president. Very rarely do I get actually the CEO, uh, especially for a large business like yourselves. So what's a day to day CEO like? You know, you get up in the morning and you're checking your email and what else? Like, g- give me a typical day for you. A typical day for me is a series of meetings, uh, some meetings uh, with our go-to-market team. So I, when I wake up, I generally try to touch base with the, our teams in Europe, where it's already midday, for instance, for them. That gives me a head start on what's happening on Europe and a typical drive to the workplace if I'm not traveling to a customer or a partner uh, would involve touching base with a series of my um, teammates, uh, whether it be my marketing counterpart, my CFO, uh, et cetera. Just quick touch base on how things are going, what's happening, uh, what needs to be done, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, and then once I'm at work, I, I like to describe my job as trying to enable others and eliminate roadblocks. So to that end, I spend a lot of time in, let's say, a budget meeting or planning meeting, or um, sometimes we prepare for our external boards and investors uh, to to call it, update them on the health of the business, the progress of the business, et cetera. But I also try to spend at least 30% of my time, if not more, with customers and partners. And I also tend to spend a lot of time with my employees because at the end of the day, if I can have a satisfied employee base, I know my customers will be taken care of. This is, we get to the part of the show where this is one of my favorite parts because I get to learn something about you that maybe most people don't know or that's outside of this federal commercial cybersecurity world. What's maybe one thing about yourself that you like to do outside of work or that's something different about you that maybe some people don't know? That's an interesting question, Jason. Uh, I would say I'm not doing much of it now, uh, but when I was uh, quite a bit younger, I would say I'm a trivia buff and a history buff. And so a team of us, uh, three to four of us, would go from one city to another and essentially compete or spar with other teams uh, in terms of who knew the trivia the best. So it's similar to like Jeopardy and others, but it's not as structured uh, and it was much more free flowing. Uh, we used to enjoy that a lot because there was a certain camaraderie involved in it and a certain level of creativity and uh, exploration involved in it. So that is something that I don't think a lot of people know about me. So did you ever go out for uh, Jeopardy? Uh, no, not uh, not for Jeopardy here. Yeah. No. Not not yet, at least, right? Not yet, at least. <laughs> yes, that's a more optimistic way of looking at it. <laughs> and and, if, and <laughs> was there a part of the trivia history that you were special specialized in? Were you more about, you know, Geography versus something else? Who knows? I was more focused on history and sports. So uh, sports trivia and history. All right. Very cool. Very interesting. All right. Well, let's take another quick break. When we come back, we can uh, complete our conversation. My guest is Sudhakar Ramakrishna, the CEO of Pulse Secure. I'm Jason Miller, and you're listening to Views from a Corner Office on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. Welcome back. You're listening to Views from a Corner Office on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. I'm your host, Jason Miller. My guest is Sudhakar Ramakrishna, the CEO of Pulse Secure. Now, Sudhakar, before break, we're talking and getting to know you and, and a little bit more about Pulse Secure. You guys are a security uh, vendor. You guys are, are seeing all the trends that are happening in the security marketplace, uh, the, the rise of ransomware. The, the, we talked a little bit about zero trust. W where is the security market, though, going more broadly? You know, if we have this conversation again in a year or two, what's going to change about the security market, specifically for the federal uh, agencies? We spoke about zero trust happening or uh, coming up in conversations on a more frequent basis. Uh, the way I would describe it is in the next two uh, to three years, zero trust will become much more of a prevalent deployment model in the federal sector, uh, as well as in the commercial sector, but clearly in the federal sector for all the reasons that we discussed. Uh, two is that some of the, call it the traditional requirements, because networks are not going to go away right away. Uh, so some of the traditional requirements, including things like 802.1x, stick requirements, et cetera, will continue to evolve. Uh, and associated with that is endpoint security and compliance, uh, even basic things like while I provide freedom to my end users to use any mobile device that they want, I need to have capabilities to ensure that the device is not jailbroken, for instance. So endpoint compliance, endpoint security will be another key requirement and will become an uh, ongoing and in increasing requirement in the federal sector. Uh, we spoke about IoT that I believe will be a very important requirement, both from a visibility standpoint as well as what we would call as enforcement. So once you know what is um, connecting, you want to take remediation actions. So that becomes an important um, element as well. Uh, so in that context, partnerships with uh, channel partners, integrators, uh, everyone becomes uh, critical because budgets and freedom dictate uh, better integration, more simplicity. So simplicity will be a very key trend and a requirement as well in the federal sector. And last but not least, uh, continuing to build solutions that are hybrid, that provide for additional business models. I am 
very optimistic that the federal sector will catch on to some of the business model trends in the commercial space, uh, some of the ones that we discussed, including subscription, including pay-as-you-go, pay-as-you-grow, et cetera. And all of this will need to be wrapped up in a orchestration and automation framework providing better analytics and therefore better visibility to our customers. So these are some of the key requirements that we see emerging more and more and more in the federal sector. And they will happen in various agencies at different speeds, uh, but everybody seems to be trending in the same direction. It's interesting. You brought up better data analytics, and I think that's the key thing that I see when I talk to CIOs all the time is the desire for more information, but also the ability to understand and process that information. Do you have that problem as a security vendor where you got to be, how do you find the right balance between not just overloading your customers with security information, but helping them understand what what, what it all means? Definitely, Jason. I, I like to distinguish between information, which is, a, let's call it reporting so-and-so uh, data points, or this is what happened, et cetera, versus insights. Uh, and our focus on analytics is much more on the insights of, hey, this is what's happening. This is what could happen. And this is what you must do uh, to protect against anything bad from happening. So while there is still a lot of value to basic reporting, uh, increasingly because of the amount of information that is being given to everyone, uh, it is more critical to move towards providing insights uh, to our customers. Uh, And that's our focus as it relates to analytics. You brought up the fact that you guys don't sell necessarily directly to the government. You work through third parties, value-added resellers, other partners. Talk a little bit about what the challenges that brings for a vendor who's trying to sell to the government, because that's maybe much different than how you sell to the commercial world. In many ways, Jason, it is similar to how we sell into the commercial world, although there are significant differences. So um, as I previously mentioned, we go through a direct touch with our customers and indirect fulfillment. So that's no different in the federal sector as well. One of the advantages, let me start with the positives uh, of working with partners, aggregators, contractors is they add a lot of value to us in terms of the requirements of the federal sector, meaning that they have many more feet on the street, Uh, they gather a lot more intelligence, so to speak, and they're able to give it back to us such that we are able to build solutions that matter more to the federal sector. So that's a very important benefit that we derive from our partner community. Uh, If you want to highlight kind of what could happen on the flip side, uh, the flip side is that we don't really have awareness or visibility of everything that goes on at the end customer. And sometimes we get slowed down, let's say, by other vendors who might be in the process or call it the bureaucracy of the system sometimes. Uh, And so in this particular case, at least so far, uh, the positives outweigh the negatives for us. And we continue to work on how we make our relationships more efficient, uh, broader, deeper, et cetera. Um, and if, if anything, we are trying to expand uh, our network of partners. Uh, and then we, as needed, can always go to our end customers and uh, learn directly from them as well. Is that a challenge that you, if you call up, a, if you have a contract with somebody, and a lot of times the, the agency will say, we, want, we only want to deal with the prime, do you, is that a problem for you guys then? They say, well, if we need to talk to somebody in the, at the agency level, we have to go through our prime contractor or our partner, or can you call them directly, you know, again, typically? That's generally never been an issue for us because what happens in most cases is that even if an agency says they want to con- uh, engage with the prime, so to speak, as you highlighted, uh, the contractor will want to take us as the subject matter experts uh, in many cases to the agencies. That's number one. Number two is that over the years, through a combination of our solution strength as well as our focus on their success, uh, we have direct access to them as well. So very, I, I can't recollect, honestly, a instance where that has been a problem for us. Uh, that's good news because a lot of times it's, it's more likely for small businesses we hear this, but where the prime is, is so territorial, they don't want to bring anyone else in except for the prime contractor. Obviously, it's maybe different for a VAR or, or for, for a bigger company like yourself. Uh, the other challenge with, that with, is true. Yeah, the other challenge with VARs is 
some of the flow down requirements? Do you have to deal with some of the procurement and other flow down requirements that that, or is it you deal with that anyways? I guess I guess what I'm looking for is does the does you not selling directly to the government put any extra burden or compliance issues on your shoulders that you wouldn't normally have? Not necessarily, Jason. I mean, we we have a relationship with the aggregators uh, as uh, like DLT Solutions and Emix. And so our contracts are very, very clear with them. And then they kind of value add on the other side by either supporting us or shielding us from the idiosyncrasies of their specific relationships with the agency. So in that regard, there's actually a benefit to working with, uh, with partners. But from time to time, there are acceptance criteria, et cetera, that are passed through. But that's completely fine because we own the entire solution. All right, very good. Um, uh, Sudhakar, we're almost out of time before I let you go. I do want to bring up one other piece of this, is, especially in the security world. There's a big push for these innovative companies. Hey, we need to bring in all these commercial companies or that you know have never done business with the government before and learn from them. And you know we've seen uh, approaches like other transaction authorities or other transaction agreements. Mm-hmm. Does this? What's your take on that? Because as you told me at the very beginning, in, in many ways, the government can, can be ahead of the commercial or at least even with the commercial world. Where do you see this kind of balance or, or this need for the, the quote-unquote innovative company coming from or, or how, how's that kind of flowing down to you guys? We do see the benefit of that sentiment or that requirement, um, Jason. The way I would uh, highlight it is that there is a meaningful, call it responsibility on part of all of us, young or mature companies, to truly understand the sector, to understand your customers, so to speak, right? So while you may have the uh, the other transaction authorities, et cetera, et cetera, it does not remove the responsibility on the vendors uh, to actually understand the federal sector and try to work towards satisfying and uh, delighting those uh, customers. In other words, understand what problems are we solving, understand how we will be beneficial to the federal sector, uh, and areas such as uh, OTAs, et cetera, are, call it, uh, a means to an end, not an end itself, so to speak. So uh, as long as the vendors are focused on what is the desired outcome, uh, they should be fine, and on the on the flip side, the federal government continuing to uh, call it cross-pollinate with the commercial sector will also allow things to be sped up uh, in terms of adoption of latest technologies, uh, understanding of latest solutions, uh, and then obviously um, improving their security postures, reducing their risk, uh, improving their visibility, uh, and obviously reducing their um, total uh, challenge as it relates to security while giving their end users more freedom to be productive in an economical fashion. All right, very nice. This has been a fascinating conversation. I really do appreciate your time. So let me thank my guest, Sudhakar Ramakrishna, the CEO of Pulse Secure. Sudhakar, thank you so much for your time. Thank you again, Jason. I'm Jason Miller, and you've been listening to Views from a Corner Office on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. You've been listening to Views from the Corner Office on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. Tune in Fridays at noon or subscribe to this show on iTunes or Podcast One. 